this is a beginning of a campaign for us to stop the process that's been going on for the last 30 years of ordinary working class people like us being ignored and taken for granted and the rich getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and working class people and our kids are seeing our futures gradually becoming less and less optimistic. We think there's a chance to change the world, to change society, but to do that we do have to make our voices heard. We're not going to be able to do it just on the internet, by tweeting or by filling in petitions, although that can help in one, one way or another. What it's all about is getting our voices heard and getting a programme for change heard and taken seriously. Because once we start getting taken seriously, that's when the powers that be, the rich, the powerful, and their uh, uh, politicians that represent them, start to worry about things and they have to start taking us seriously. And without I mean, any kind of working class representation, people like us, we just have to go begging and pleading, filling out petitions, writing letters and emails. It's not enough. We need people like us up there as MPs and councillors. And that's the whole point behind the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition. It's a way of bringing people together. So I'm not going to speak anymore. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Chris Williamson, who until recently was himself a Labour MP who supported the fighting socialist policies of the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn at that time. And we're really pleased that he's agreed to come and speak at the launch meeting uh, today. So I'll hand over to Chris, and before Chris begins, I will just point out on the platform as well, we've also got uh, Siobhan as well, who is from the Socialist Party, a socialist campaigner who's been fighting against cuts and austerity uh, <coughs> to speak as well. And just finally, uh, Dave Nellis, who will be outlining uh, our campaign and uh, what we stand for uh, as Tusk. Once our top table have finished speaking, We'll make sure that we get a chance for everybody uh, to speak as well, uh, who's come to the meeting, to ha have your say and ask questions. And if there's questions that need to be answered, uh, we'll put some time aside at the end to make sure that everybody, uh, hopefully, will get an answer in one form or another. Um, final point, the toilets at the back and the bars over there, and the doors over there, I think legal stuff out of the way. So, over to you, Chris. introduction and it's great to, to be here in Erlington uh, working to make sure we can elect a socialist MP for this uh, constituency on the 3rd of March and with uh, a fair wind I think we've got a great chance of, of achieving that. I've been out on the NOS for uh, I think three or four times already and there is a great deal of dissatisfaction it's got to be said with all the mainstream parties and people are really inspired actually by what uh, Dave represents, what the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition represents in this election and it's really important I think that we do everything in our power to to take that message out in the community here because I do believe we are on the cusp of, of something really special here. I do think there's a real potential to start to shake up the cosy status quo down in Westminster. I mean I spent 44 years in the Labour Party flogging a dead horse it turns out and you know I think I thought I was labouring under the misapprehension that one day we might be able to create a mass party and get a left-wing leader in place and we could start to set about a social transformation of the country. And I thought all my Christmases had come together when Jeremy Corbyn <laughs> was elected as a leader of the Labour Party. And then we were putting on, well, get on, getting onto the uh, ballot paper, of course, was the first thing, but then we started to put on, you know, members, tens of thousands of new members were joining the party, then when he got elected you know, tens of thousands of more members joined the Labour Party like nearly 600,000 full members of the Labour Party <coughs> and when you take affiliated and registered supporters into account, it was like over 800,000, and yet we still didn't control the Labour Party in spite of the fact that we had a mass movement, we had a left-wing leader, still the party was in the hands of the establishment and uh, that, I'm afraid to say, is why uh, I've certainly left the Labour Party now. The Labour Party has certainly lost its way. There is no real difference between the Tories and the Labour Party. It's a kind of red Tory or a blue Tory. You sort of take your pick. There is a neoliberal status quo. Whoever wins the election, you know, the, the capitalist class 
the corporate elites just continued and as if nothing's changed. And, you know, we're seeing that now, aren't we, with the uh, election of uh, Sir Keir Starmer. But, uh, you know, you look back, really, I mean, the last time we had a, a Labour government, I mean, what did they do? I mean, it was a Labour government that introduced tuition fees. It wasn't Tories, it was the Labour Party that did that. It was a Labour Party, a Labour government that introduced the private health care into the National Health Service, started the privatisation process of the National Health Service. The National Health Service that was founded by the Labour Party was started to be dismantled by a Labour government. What a disgrace. What an absolute disgrace that is. And of course, we're also seeing, and Birmingham has been a, a particular victim of this, uh, that we saw under, well, certainly under the Tories, under Thatcher, but continued under uh, New Labour and Tony Blair, the offshoring of good quality manufacturing skilled jobs. <coughs> the tens of thousands of jobs that have gone, I mean, as you know, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, you know, it's been technology, this is why there are not so many people, not so many jobs in, in manufacturing. And yes, of course, that has accounted for some of the job uh, reductions that we've seen. But the vast bulk of it is a really direct result of corporations moving their operations to low wage economies offshore. And where we do see uh, technology coming, and where we do see automation, well surely that should be used, not to just increase profits, but to improve working conditions, to reduce the working week. We are the fifth biggest economy in the world. Why are we still having to work all hours, God send, in the fifth biggest economy in the world, when we see all this new technology coming on stream? Why aren't we in a situation where we're actually seeing the fruits of that new technology, the fruits of that big economy, being shared more equitably. But it isn't being shared, is it? In this fifth biggest economy in the world, we've got 14 million people living in poverty. One and a half million people are destitute. People sleeping and dying, indeed, on the streets, not sleepers. You didn't used to see that when I was alive, despite my youthful appearance, comrades. I uh, remember in the 1960s and 70s, you literally didn't see people sleeping on the street and begging on the street. Now it's commonplace in every town or city in the land. And as I say, you know, Jeremy Corbyn offered us hope that there would be a change, but of course it never, it never happened. I've got five minutes gone, I've told I've got 10, 15 minutes, so I've got 10 minutes to go, so I'll try and keep a bit of time, so thank you for that. So Keir Starmer talking about, you know, the party being under new management. Well, you're not kidding, you're not kidding. <laughs> what is that new management all about, though? We've got an energy crisis, haven't we? Energy bills are going to go up by around 54%. What's Labour's response? Well, we'll reduce VAT by 5%. I mean, it's ridiculous. But we're going to rule out the prospect of any public ownership. No, no, no. That's not on the cards in a future Labour government. But that's why I say there's no real difference. Just tinkering at the edges. That's all a Labour this constituency. It would be a reaffirmation, frankly, of, of, of a broken system. What else are they offering? We have a cost of living crisis, don't we? And we saw the Tories break their solemn pledge that uh, pensions would increase in line with wage rises or in line with uh, the rate of inflation. And of course, they've broken that pledge now, haven't they? But what did the Labour Party do? What did the Labour MPs do in the House when this was voted on recently? Well, they just sat on their hands. And so what we're going to see now, in, in, this, in the teeth of this cost of living crisis, what we're going to see is a situation where the poorest people in the country, social security benefits and pensioners, are going to see a real terms reduction. So while fuel bills are going through the roof, Pensioners and unemployed people and disabled people who have to rely on social security are going to see their living standards reduced still further. It's an absolute disgrace. And of course, the other thing is, they are incredibly pro war, aren't they? They're gagging for war. You know, Jeremy Corbyn was wrong to uh, criticise uh, NATO. They're desperately keen because it seems to me they're in the pockets of the military industrial complex, aren't they? I mean, Who's doing really well out of this crisis in Ukraine at the moment? If you just look at the, the share prices of some of these uh, arms, and, uh, arms and companies, these weapons manufacturers, Lockheed Martin, for example, their share prices are soaring. They will benefit from a war because they're going to sell more missiles, more weapons, 
more guns, more bullets to kill and maim people. And the notion of peace is somehow seen as being uh, disloyal, as being uh, uh, against this country. It's an absolute scandal, and we have to call it out. And so that's why I think it's so important that we use this election to get somebody like Dave with his fantastic track record, unparalleled track record in, in my opinion, uh, to actually go down there and to, and to shake up that status quo. But of course Dave is also an incredible uh, you know, community champion as well. And there's plenty to be going at, isn't there, in terms of the local issue. So we, you know, the local party's broken in terms of the Westminster situation, but it's pretty much broken, isn't it, at a local level as well. What is the local authority doing about the housing crisis that's befallen the people of Birmingham? I mean, rough sleepers all over the place in Birmingham. People find it almost impossible to get a council house on the waiting list for years. This is a political choice. It's all very well them saying, oh, you know, there are cuts from central government. That's true. But there is no impediment now on local authorities to deal with the housing crisis because there's no restriction on what's called the housing revenue account that they used to mean that local authorities were restricted on how much they could borrow to invest. And of course, housing investment is very different because the, any money that a local authority borrows to build a council house or indeed to acquire a property on the open market, the cost of doing that is serviced by the income stream from the rents. So it's a political choice. They should be building far more council houses. And that would, of course, generate jobs for people, good quality jobs, skilled jobs for people, so you're providing that economic driver as well as dealing with a social problem, providing a lower cost alternative to the private rented sector. I mean, that's a racket, isn't it, the private rented sector? Very often people are you know, forced into substandard privately rented accommodation. And wouldn't it be wonderful if the local authority was to use the powers at its disposal to build houses and to acquire houses on the open market? I used to be a bricklayer back in the 1970s, despite my soft hands, I used to really lay bricks. And, you know, look, if there was a municipalisation programme, local authority would, you know, go and buy properties on the open market. Obviously, building takes some time to actually acquire the skilled labour, labourers, uh, the skilled workers to do, to do the... Uh, necessary uh, building and so on. Um, but while you're training people up, while you're training people up, uh, you could actually be acquiring properties on the open market to deal with that housing crisis that uh, Birmingham is experiencing. And I think Dave would be somebody who would uh, make that case very, very cogently. And I think if we can alert people to the fact that it's a political choice, this housing crisis, that the council is choosing not to use the powers at their disposal to deal with it, I think people will actually turn away from those who they put their faith in on the local authority for, well, whether it be Tory or, or Labour, they've all let them down. And the same is true, you know, for cuts, because as alternative to the cuts in the public services that we've seen, they could be using the huge uh, reserves that local authorities have at their disposal. They could be introducing a redistributive council tax where they only ask the wealthy to pay a bit more. And to please or even reduce the council tax for the rest. There are alternative choices available to people who run these local authorities. They just choose not to do it. And so I think our mission is to go out there and inspire people, to raise political consciousness, to raise political expectations as well. And I can't think of a better person to do that than Dave Nellis. Because, as I say, somebody with a proven track record when he was the MP for Coventry, I think he won uh, the uh, MP of the Year, didn't you? Some award, he was seen as the, the best backbench MP in the House of Commons. And how did the Labour Party reward Dave for that? They, they kicked him out <laughs> back then. And we, you know what, I mean, we're back in those days today, aren't we? It's, uh, it's an absolute. Uh, travesty, frankly, the way the Labour Party is operating. So we have a situation where we have a real opportunity now, it seems to me, to make a real difference here, to elect somebody who will be a genuine community champion, somebody who will absolutely shake up that status quo, that cosy status quo between the Tories and the Labour Party down in Westminster. Somebody who will certainly challenge the local authority. When Dave lost his seat, back in 1992, he didn't sort of 
take his bat and ball home. He continued to work as a community champion, providing advice and support, and representing local people, and, and actually got elected onto the local authority back then as well. Dave is the real deal, and uh, there are very few of them, if any, in Parliament at the moment. We've got a chance to make a real difference if we actually can get Dave elected here in early term. So I urge everybody to use uh, every sinew in your body to support this campaign, to get out there on the knocker, to talk to your friends and your family, <coughs> in the workplace, in the club, in the pub, to actually make the argument that we need a change. That term, time for a change, it's a, it's, it's a happy phrase, it's much overused, but God, if ever there was a time for a change, it's now, isn't it, comrades? Let's make that change happen. Let's make sure we elect Dave Nunes. Thanks very much, Chris, for that excellent speech. I'm going to now hand you over to Siobhan, who's uh, going to be speaking in a few minutes just regarding the situation uh, facing the council cuts in Birmingham. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you mind, I haven't said anything yet, but thank you. <laughs> so my name is Siobhan, um, I am a member of the Socialist Party um, here in Birmingham. I've lived in Birmingham all of my life. Um, and I have to say that going back not that many years, I was not interested in politics, be it elections or being active in politics, anything at all. And the reason for that was that my very first experience with voting for an MP was in the 2010 general election, when I voted for the Liberal Democrats, then led by Nick Clegg. Um, if you don't remember it, <laughs> he made one fairly major election promise, which was that he would not, he would vote against the raising of tuition fees. Um, and then as soon as he got into a coalition with the um, Conservatives, he in fact voted in support of tripling tuition fees. Now that actually didn't affect me personally, I was at um, uni at the time, so it didn't, it didn't come into effect while I was there. But it did tell me that there was literally no point in voting in elections because, well, if they can just say one thing and then deliver something completely different and there be no consequences for that whatsoever, then what is the point? So I just thought, well, no, that, that. I'm just not going to take any part in that. And then for the next 12 years, we've watched us Tory and then Lib Dem um, austerity rain down on ordinary people. And Birmingham has, I mean, every major city has been hit hard, but Birmingham has been hammered by cuts. And some of them are hard to explain how vicious they are. Like, every council-run nursery in the city was closed down. All of them. Um, we got, had the devastating cuts to Rempoy, who used to help disabled people into, <coughs> into work. I've worked in schools for a lot of that time, and the overwhelming majority of schools in Birmingham now say that they physically cannot run their special education needs departments because there is not enough funding and there are not enough teachers or any other form of support. The major cuts that have come to schools have been on pupil premium, which if you don't know is funding that goes into schools to support the lowest income bracket of children with their academic um, pursuits. Um, and that has been really cut in major cities and Birmingham was one of the hardest hit by that. But it wasn't just cut, it was redistributed so much wealthier constituencies actually saw a rise in their pupil premium funding. So the decisions being made in, for cuts, particularly in Birmingham, were not random or just, just from central government. They were vicious, and they were aimed at the people who would definitely not fight back, who would have no voice with which to fight back. And the turning point for me came a couple of years after the 2010. It might have been just the year after. Um, my mother is a, um, a care worker. She worked as a um, residential carer which is for adults with learning disabilities. And mobility allowance um, across the board was gotten rid of, not just cut, just it's gone. Um, and mobility allowance allowed the residents of her care home to go out to day centres and have uh, tactile learning and um, a bit of socialisation. It was the one and only form of independence, a bit of normality to uh, these adults with learning disabilities. Adults with such profound learning disabilities that they could not live at home. Um, and to hear the stories of how they just couldn't do it anymore, unless they could pay privately. So unless they were wealthy, they just weren't allowed anymore. Because they just lost this thing, and nobody could explain why. And it was absolutely heartbreaking. Good timing. Um, <laughs> but it was worse than that. It was enraging. 
and you would sit and just feel this fury bubbling and just think, how, how can anyone do this? How could anyone pick on this group of people that could not have less of a voice in this city? So I thought, oh no, I'm not going to do what they want me to do. I'm not just going to not be involved. Because not being involved keeps the status quo in place, and that status quo hasn't worked for us. And it's not working for vulnerable people, it's not working for ordinary people, or working people. Um, so I'm going to do something. So I looked around for somebody else who was doing something, and I found the Socialist Party. And I've been in the Socialist Party 10 years now, I think. But obviously not, because I can't possibly be that old. So <laughs> it might be less than that. But, um, um, but we're, so I joined to, in order to fight against these really unfair attacks on ordinary people, and to fight for a fairer system. Um, and we've been doing that now for um, ever since. Um, so I would urge anyone here today, if you are a, a local and you can vote in this election, please vote for Dave. We will need an MP who will be a real voice for us um, in Parliament. Because there's an obvious bad guy to these cuts. There's an obvious, the Tories have done this. Um, and then for the first five years, they were propped up for the Liberal Democrats. But also, for in that time, this, Labour, this council has been run by Labour. Ten out of the twelve years, I believe, was entirely Labour controlled. So all of those cuts, those vicious, horrible cuts that have happened to this city, were put through by Labour. And not reluctantly, in many cases, gleefully. So just the bin strike a few years ago, where they went at it with such... It was like they wanted it to happen. So what has happened to Labour that they're excited to attack workers in this way? Um, so none of the major parties, or any other party, are doing what we need them to do. They're not providing that voice. So if you can vote today, I would absolutely urge you to do so, to give us that ordinary person, or worker's voice uh, in Parliament. Um, but also, if you are not currently involved with the Socialist Party, I would urge you to get involved. Come and speak to one of us today. You can get involved with this campaign. You can get involved with... Uh, you could join us if you want to. We'd love that, of course. But you can come and ask any questions you want to ask and know how you can become uh, a campaigner in your city. Um, because when we will fight on this election, of course, when we fight for a voice in Parliament. When the election is over, we'll keep fighting. And we'll fight... Uh, on picket lines, in workplaces, and in the streets for a fairer system for ordinary people. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Siobhan. Um, just before you uh, finally move on to Dave, uh, we'll just polite in mind if you could put your phones on silent. Uh, <laughs> not because of the Benny Hill thing, it's just because you know, <laughs> Community uh, <laughs> 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 activists. There you go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. Skimpy, skimpily dressed and all that. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> lovely image to have in my head when we finish up. Anyway, uh, finally, uh, we'll just move on to our final speaker, Dave Nellis. Um, and I'll just point out anybody who hasn't heard of Dave or met Dave before. Uh, Dave was previously. Uh, a Labour MP between 1983 and 1992. Chris has already pointed out the fact that he was also a Socialist Party councillor on Coventry City Council uh, after that point as well. And during the entire time, um, Dave was famous uh, and, uh, and, and peed up for a lot of people, particularly in the Labour Party, for the fact that he only took a worker's wage, uh, which, uh, which, as far as we're concerned, is, uh, is, is a critical part of making sure that when you are elected that you don't end up uh, being sucked into the machine and then you're going down to London, going in the stranger's bar, and your free sandwiches and your subsidised beer, living a different lifestyle to working class people. And let's face it, it's working class people who put you, put you in that position. Uh, we don't expect you to go down there and have, a, have, it, have it on us and have a good time while we're all struggling. And obviously Dave has not just said he's going to do that, he's actually done that and we're really proud of that. So um, I won't say anymore, Dave doesn't want to use the microphone because he's going to have his hands free for his notes. So I'm going to start speaking now and uh, hand you over to Dave Nellis. Thank you. Firstly, my apologies. Um, I went to see uh, Erdings and Local um, in the, the shopping centre a couple of days ago. Spent an hour uh, chatting, you'll probably see some of it on their website uh, in a day or so's time. And one of the questions towards the end of the interview was, how are you going to answer people when they say, you're not from Birmingham, you don't live in Birmingham? And my answer was, don't worry, I'm only 30 minutes down the road. <laughs> but we left at 11 o'clock this morning. <laughs> and I knew of three of the six 
diversions we've been through, <laughs> we've been to Berksville, bloody place. They're spending a hundred billion pounds on HS2 to get people from London to Birmingham 15 minutes quicker. And it's taking 90 minutes now to get from Coventry across to uh, Birmingham. So my apologies. Um, my name's Dave Nellis. I'm the uh, candidate for the Trade Unions and Socialist Coalition in the parliamentary by-election on uh, March uh, the 3rd. And what I want to do in, in the 20 minutes or, or thereabouts is to tell you a little bit about myself and Ted <laughs> preempted a couple of points I wanted to uh, uh, make. Uh, but more importantly, as I'll explain, a little bit about why we're standing in this um, election. Now, I'm going to start off by being completely immodest. Um, I think I'm the best qualified and most experienced candidate um, in this election by far. I started off um, in 1982 and spent four years on West Midlands County Council. So I dealt with Birmingham and Coventry on a regional uh, basis. Um, I then went and did um, nine years in Parliament. Um, and whilst I was a backbencher, um, I was one of the first MPs to bring in a private members <coughs> bill to establish a national uh, minimum mm -hmm. uh, wage. Um, I extended the law to allow thousands of families with severely disabled babies disability liver allowance from birth, which didn't exist at the, uh, at the time. I extended the law to protect health and safety shop stewards on oil rigs, because employment legislation traditionally only applies on land, it doesn't apply in the offshore uh, waters. <clears throat> and I led the parliamentary opposition that 18 million people refusing to pay the poll tax not only brought down the poll tax, but brought down Mrs. Thatcher in November 1990. <laughs> Well, I'm a party for that because um, one of my best mates, Terry Fields, MP for Liverpool Broadway, did 58 days in Bolton Prison because we took the decision as socialists, members of the Socialist Party, and uh, uh, or the militants as it was called uh, uh, then, uh, and the leaders of the Anti Poll Tax Federation, that when Mrs. Thatcher and Labour councils were putting pensioners in maximum security prisons like Dove for three months. We, at Younger, not physically able, would stand in between the government and those who were being attacked in that way and say, take us first. Tell you was the first one to go and he did the, uh, the days I stayed in Walton in prison and I was next and Roy Hartsley and Claire Short were the two people who moved my expulsion from the Labour Party for bringing the Labour Party into disrepute <coughs> by standing shoulder to shoulder with 18 million people who couldn't pay that uh, poll tax. So, I was expelled. I, I then uh, worked for 25 years as a welfare rights and uh, debt specialist, 20 of them for the Citizen Advice Bureau. And I represented hundreds of people in the local county court and at social security appeal tribunals, stopping evictions, stopping their bankruptcies, uh, getting people their benefits back, and uh, so on. So, that's why I think I'm the best qualified to stand in this election. But that's not the reason why I'm standing in this election. Chris was kind enough to mention about local campaigns. I want to put on record the fact we spent uh, quite a long time, I could say, in the cold um, with uh, uh, Stephen and Estelle from Shorty for uh, playing fields uh, last night. I now understand a lot better um, the position and the importance of the playing fields uh, in that uh, area of the constituency. And as I explained to Stephen Stell last night, in, in the areas I have represented in Coventry, we have had exactly the same uh, problems, where the council wanted to sell off a, 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 an area of land in the playing fields that local community used. And we mounted a huge campaign, 500 affidavits uh, signed uh, in community centres like this of people who'd used those fields for 50 years. We searched arcane law called village green applications, successfully prevented the green space being taken away, and now we've won national funding because of the 14th century Cartusian monastery that was a ruins on this area that nobody really knew existed. Now it's classed as one of the top 10 
ecclesiastical uh, monuments in the whole uh, the country. And it was the community that won that, but it did help that we had three of us on the council from the Socialist Party that could do the work in that campaign as uh, well. So we'll fight for those. We'll fight against the loss of jobs and the exporting of jobs, because Chris has mentioned uh, that. And the closure of GKN and the exporting uh, of jobs, the loss of those uh, skills, that doesn't need to happen. The Tories could have nationalised GKN and kept that factory alive in this constituency. Now, you know, often hear people say things like that. It must be impossible. Not at all. I started my life as an electrical and engineering apprentice for what was then British Aircraft Corporation, British Aerospace. And I did my first year's training in the Rolls-Royce Technical College in Bristol in Philly. And in February 1971, so that's what, 51 years ago, we were called into the lecture theatre in Rolls-Royce Technical College to be told that Edward Heath, the Tory Prime Minister, had nationalised Rolls-Royce to keep the engineering skills in one place. When it comes to defence, last October, the Tories nationalised Sheffield Forge Masters because of the contribution it can make to uh, uh, the, the metals that are used in things like small-scale uh, nuclear power for nuclear submarines and so on. I would argue the contribution that GKM could, make, could have made for the future of electric vehicle manufacturing in this country means that was a candidate that if we had an halfway decent government should have been nationalised, kept those skills together, and kept the community uh, uh, benefiting from a decent workplace with people on decent wages. So we will fight for those things as and when they uh, come up. We won't be a manager, like my main two opponents in this uh, election, acting as uh, different wings of the uh, establishment, but a shop steward that acts on behalf of working people and their families, whether it's in workplaces or in communities. But that's not the main reason I'm standing either. And it's not that I'm doing it for the money. <laughs> As has been mentioned, um, MPs are on £82,000 a, a, a year. I think they're overpaid. I think that when a new gas and electric bill drops on your mat in April, and it's £60 a month more than you're paying at the moment, it feels a lot different to working families in an area like Erdington than an MP on three times that wage of the average people in this area and two or three times the uh, holidays and the rest of the entitlement. MPs are insulated from day-to-day -day problems. They don't feel the same threatened as ordinary people do. So in the 1980s, um, me and my family, and, and Jane's here with me uh, today, and she wasn't working for most of the time I was a member of Parliament, we took a wage that the engineering union across the ten biggest factories in Coventry calculated was the tool room rate, the skilled workers' uh, uh, rate, uh, and it was well less than half an MP's uh, wage, and the rest we donated to campaigns and to strike funds and things that benefited local people and their campaigns. And that's not really the reason why I'm standing in this no, this is the reason. The Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition, and I'm going to call it Tusk uh, from, from now on, they've asked me to stand. Because if either of my main two opponents in this election were elected, it wouldn't make a bit of difference to working people's lives in this area. If Robert Holden, the Tory candidate, is elected, he's a loyal Tory. Boris Johnson would still have an 80 seat majority if he's elected on March the 3rd. The Tory party would still treat working people with contempt. contempt. They made up the pandemic rules for us, which the majority of us abided by to protect our loved ones whilst they're having parties down in 10 Downing Street. They ignored them. But if Paulette Hamilton was elected on March the 3rd, if Labour would, she'd be loyal Labour in the same way as Robert Alden would be a loyal Tory. And I think Siobhan's words are right. Labour shows a contempt for working people in this city 
and nationally. She tried to force, as cabinet member of Birmingham Council, on £41,000 a year as a cabinet member, low-paid, mainly women workers in the home care service, to take a cut in hours which could have led up to thousands of pounds cut in their wages. Now, to be honest, that, that contempt would fit in well with the direction that Keir Starmer is taking uh, the Labour Party. The only difference would be, she'd be on twice the salary in 82,000. <laughs> she was on at 41,000 when she was sitting in the Cabinet making that uh, decision. None of the other candidates in this election will challenge the establishment view that in a decade-long period of economic crisis, and now in a post-pandemic period of economic crisis, working people and their families have to bear the brunt of it because the system must remain unchanged. Like that bit in the, in the hymn about you know, the, the, the Lord in his castle and the poor at the gate. You know, mm -hmm. their, 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 their estate is ordered and it will always remain uh, the same. Well, we, think we can send a voice that will challenge uh, that. Independent of the main party, shake up the establishment, <coughs> not become part of it, and try and be an MP that the system can't buy. Now, a little bit more about me. I was born in North Yorkshire, um, top end of North Yorkshire, on the, on the coast, uh, a place called Salton. Um, my dad was a fitter for 43 years in the steelworks on the North East Coast. My mum cleaned uh, the branch of uh, the bank in our village, a former mining village, ironstone, not, uh, not, not coal mining. And, and the greatest thing my mum and dad wanted for their son and daughters uh, was for them to have a better and an easier life than they had coming out of the Second World War. We can't say that to our children, then. We can't promise them that tomorrow is going to be easier than yesterday. In the 1950s and, and, and 60s, when I was growing up, one skilled wage for a couple of years would buy you a house. It would give you a couple of weeks' uh, holiday, in my case, in the caravan in in, in, in past where I got the idea for that, you didn't have when I retired, was it? In, in, in skipped. And that's because young people today face eight to ten times the wages that they can earn to be qualified for a mortgage to buy a, a home. Then, like Siobhan said, education was, was free. Now there's about 12 to 1,500 young people in Erdington at 18 who go off to university. They come back three years later with a £50,000 debt. Again, putting pressure on their inability to get a mortgage, to get a, 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 a home. We want to see the abolition of fees and loans and a return to free education. But half the 18-year-olds don't go to university. And the chances in today's world, compared to what I what the, uh, grew up in, for a decent job and therefore getting... Uh, things like a, 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 a home are far less than they were then. In Birmingham, 12 and a half percent. One in every eight people are unemployed, and those who do enter into the job market enter into insecure employment, temporary contracts, zero-hour contracts, lower uh, pay. And Birmingham Council, under Labour control, has contributed to that by not fighting the Tory cuts of the last 12 years. Hundreds of millions of pounds have been lost in services, and we've lost a whole lot of local community important services because of that, and thousands, tens of thousands of jobs have gone from the, uh, the city. So we not only need an MP on March the 3rd with a new approach to challenge that, we also need new councillors as well to challenge that. And part of this campaign, and we'll be brutally honest with you, we're using this camp, part of this campaign, we're using it to find the next generation of working class, community, practically trading and involved as well, people who will stand in May in Birmingham, Erdington and in Birmingham more widely, in order to challenge the uh, council and their uh, uh, the direction. Part of a national challenge where we hope to get approaching 1,000 new uh, anti-austerity candidates standing around the country. Now, it's um, ironic, isn't it, that the first letter that uh, uh, Paulette Hamilton put out to her constituents says, I also know we need to clean the place up, collect the rubbish, sweep the streets 
and tackle the fly tickers. What it's actually saying is, vote for me, I'm part of the council that wanted to get rid of the bin workers. Yeah. <laughs> I'm part of the council that actually ended bulk waste free collection. Yeah. I'm part of the council that charges for that service. I helped create the mess on the street, so vote for me on double my weight so I can clear it up. <laughs> So I say young people face an entirely different, this new generation, an entirely different world to the one I grew up in. And it's going to get worse. The last few months, and certainly the next few months, working people are going to be hit with price rises like we haven't actually seen, probably for one or two uh, decades. Gas and uh, electric prices are due to rise again by 54% uh, in April and again in October. The official figure is um, about £680 if you're on uh, a tariff or about £720 if you're on a prepayment uh, uh, meter. The Joseph Roundtree Trust uh, estimates um, that uh, low-income families will face an average bill of £2,300 from uh, uh, April. Now, again, in this letter from Paulette Hamilton, she says, I'm backing Labour's plan for an immediate £200 cut in energy bills. That's in a bill that's going to go up the best part of £1,000. Labour's offering £200. The Tories are more generous. They're offering £350. <laughs> <laughs> but, but £200 of that is a loan. Mm -hmm. That over the next five years, the energy companies will charge you an even higher rate to call back that uh, 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 money. So, whether it's Labour or it's Tory, of those bills, well over £500, they're going to put on your backs without any assistance. Now, why should we be paying for any rise in gas and electric? Any rise at all? The last 10 years, the big oil and gas companies have paid their shareholders £200 billion pounds in dividends. Now, when you raise the idea that when Shell declares 14 billion last week and BP, I think it was 9 uh, billion. By the way, both of those are predicting 40 billion pounds in profit, just two companies, in the next 12 uh, uh, months. When you raise the idea of renationalisation, these are basic industries which are there for the public, uh, their utilities which are there for the public use, they should be publicly owned, democratically controlled. They say things like, well, you can't do that, you we know, have to invest. Dividends paid to shareholders are paid after you've done investment, not before. The price rises we're facing are going to add up to about 18 to 20 billion pounds over the next six to nine months. 200 billion pounds in profit should be back in the public purse. It should be used for accelerated investment into clean, sustainable, renewable energy and used to cut the bills of working class uh, people, not paid in shareholders' dividends to the rich and uh, uh, already uh, wealthy within uh, uh, society. And Keir Harmer has explicitly said, whilst that used to be the policy of the Labour Party, it no longer uh, uh, is. Now, it's not just energy, it's food. For, for many families, there will be a choice between food or fuel when those bills are, are coming uh, uh, in. And you know, see in stories in the papers, of people crowdfunding to try and raise the money to pay uh, a bill. Or uh, the increased use of, of food banks. We've got 17 food banks in Coventry, I have to confess, I don't know the exact number in Birmingham, but when I was with the Citizen Advice Bureau, I helped set up um, the, the remote uh, advice session service in all the food banks in Coventry. So when people came to get the food bank, we'd have an advisor in the CAB that they could talk to <laughs> over a tablet and the internet and get some uh, 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 advice and, uh, and so on. But those food rises, the fuel that's already risen, the energy that's uh, coming, the, the rise in broadband, the rise in national insurance, the council tax that will come in uh, April. That's why workers are beginning to, uh, to fight back. It's why, for example, in Coventry, the 77 HGV drivers, Unite members, uh, wasted drivers employed by Coventry uh, Council are absolutely right to be fighting for a decent uh, pay rise to try and protect 
what's already happened to those wages and to insulate them from the one to two thousand pounds that every family is going to find cut from their living standards in the next uh, few months. Now, I've been a member of United and its predecessors for 48 years, particularly proud of the direction my union is now taking. 111 disputes we've got on at the moment around the, the country, trying to hold the line and trying to uh, 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 fight uh, back. And the politics of that which we need is an MP that would go down to Westminster and start a national campaign for a £15 an hour minimum wage in this country. So <laughs> Conscious of time, let me try and run through a bit faster. But then there's those who are not here. There's the, the retired, or those who are unable to work because of illness or disability, or are they going to find work? The Tories have cut uh, on, uh, universal credit by uh, £20. I'm fairly sure the, uh, the Tory uh, candidate, if elected, would support Boris Johnson <laughs> on uh, that. Our pensioners get one of the worst rates of state retirement uh, pension in almost any country in Europe. The maximum state retirement uh, pension currently is £180 in Britain. In Ireland, it's 212 In the Netherlands, it's 254 And in Denmark, it's £366 a week. In other words, twice the rate it is in Britain. If elected, we would fight for a 50% increase in pensions and benefits so that working people who are unable to work or have gone past working age are not walking down the high street trying to find the barbers that's got a deal for pensioners on a Wednesday uh, uh, morning or shopping in the supermarkets at nine o'clock at night because that's when the reductions start to take place and you can get the food that's coming out of uh, date that bit ch uh, cheaper but to have the dignity to walk down the street with your hell, head held high Paying the same bills as everybody else because you've got enough money in your pocket in able to, uh, to do that. And you can't say that for people on pensions and on benefits at the uh, moment. Now, we raise things like that because it's impossible. You cannot afford. How much is it going to cost? Well, I, I make a career in knowing these things. <laughs> <laughs> we spend £250 billion a year at the moment on pensions and benefits. So a 50% rise is £125 billion pounds more. It does sound a lot of money. It is a lot of money. But we are the fifth richest country in the world. When the banks crashed because of their gambling and speculation in 2008, for the next few years, this country found £400 billion pounds to bail out the banks. Mind you, the price came back on us with council cuts, with a, a, a decade uh, a freeze of, of wages. By the way, that decade was the worst decade for wages in this country since the Napoleonic Wars 200 years uh, 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 ago. But we are a very rich uh, uh, country. It's, it is ironic that when Jeremy Corbyn stood in uh, June 2017 and December 2019, he promised build more council houses, uh, end tuition fees, improve wages and benefits, take a few essential industries back into uh, public uh, uh, ownership. All of, I mean, I think... Some of them were a bit milder than they should have been, but they're all things we would support and campaign for. <laughs> and uh, he got the best vote for Labour since Clam uh, in December 17. Three and a half, nearly four million extra votes. No other party's done that in the last 70 years. Then two years of sustained character assassination and uh, the defeat that took place in uh, December 20. And by the way, it wasn't the first worst defeat in the since the 1930s. The number of votes Jeremy got on a national scale was more than Ed Miliband got in 2015, more than Gordon Brown got in 2010, and more than Tony Blair got in 2005. But, what was the one thing that Theresa May said about Jeremy Corbyn's policies? We can't afford them. There's no magic money tree. <laughs> so the crash comes, and we find not 82 billion of Jed's promises, but 400 bail out the banks. Then the pandemic comes along two years ago, and we find another £400 billion, pound, again mainly to protect businesses during the uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, itself. And not only protect, by the way, but with some of the dodgy deals that were uh, done, something like £4.5 billion pounds went on PPE contracts without any checks and uh, balances, which now the, the tax people and the treasurer are saying, we'll never get that back. You're on universal credit. You've got to do a couple of hours cleaning down the bloody road. 
I'll tell you, they'll find investigators, find out, and get your five or ten quid back off you. But when it's the treasurer's mates, particularly the one down the road from around the pub that got that big million pound uh, 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 con con contract, they seem not to uh, uh, worry uh, uh, about it. some four billion gone in fraudulent uh, uh, claims. Now, that's a lot of money, but I haven't actually mentioned the two biggest ones yet. The two biggest ones are these. First weekend in May, the first Sunday in May, the Sunday Times brings out an annual rich list. It's been doing this for about 25 years. In 2008, when the banks went down, the richest 1,000 families in Britain were worth £250 billion. Pounds. We then had a decade of austerity. Council services gone, wages frozen. The worst decade uh, for 200 uh, years. So we lost 600,000 jobs from council and so on. But, by the way, because of that, communities were fractured, uh, we didn't have the resources put in, and if you think about things like crime, particularly amongst youth, the fact that we have no glue called youth centres and youth workers, and people that give young people a stake in, in a future uh, in, in a town or a city, contributes to the fact that we have those problems further down the, uh, uh, the line. And the NHS, we were totally unprepared for this pandemic two years ago. We had 4,000 Intensive care beds in January 2020. Germany had 27,000 intensive care beds. We had 100,000 jobs in the NHS, 42,000 of them nurses, unfilled, largely because a decade of wage freezes meant that health workers were 15 to 20% worse off and they were leaving to try and get jobs so they could afford. And they, we, we, we've got the stories as well of nurses using food banks in order to uh, make ends. Uh, 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 meet and, and so on. So we had that to uh, us a uh, decade. At the end of that decade, 2008 to 2018, the richness came out. The same 1,000 families, worth £250 billion pounds at the beginning, £770 billion pounds worth by the end of that. They tripled their wealth whilst the rest of society was suffering in that way. And we should do something about that. <coughs> The last thing, and I'm, it will be the last thing, I apologise, the snowstorm of statistics in this uh, speech, I've only got a couple of pages uh, to finish off. Uh, um, it's, it's this, I spoke earlier about growing up in the 1960s. Uh, uh, I know the 60s and 70s weren't uh, perfect, but we still had to struggle. I mean, two days ago, I was in the Priory Rooms in, the, in, in Birmingham uh, Centre, the 50th anniversary on Thursday, the 10th of uh, February, of one of the greatest uh, uh, moments in working class history in Britain when 30,000 engineering workers from uh, uh, Birmingham down tools, marched to Saltley Gate and uh, stood on the picket lines of the, uh, the miners and brought that strike to a successful uh, conclusion. It was a proud day on Thursday to be with some of those conveners from uh, Jaguar Land Rover and from uh, uh, other factories in, uh, in, in Birmingham. But even with those battles, by the way, in 1975, we were one of the most equal countries on the planet. Every pound that was made, however, in the economy in a year in Britain, yeah. two-thirds of it went to working people in wages, and about one-third went to the rich. Fast forward 40 years with Margaret Thatcher and the succeeding Prime Ministers who followed her economics and the other that uh, Chris uh, mentioned. And Today's one pound that is made, only 50% comes to working people, and 50% goes to the rich. That's because we're paying things like VAT on all the basics that we pay on that the rich don't uh, pay. Or their tax rates, which used to be 80 or 90% in the 1970s, have now been dropped through the floor. They can push their money over to uh, uh, tax havens who couldn't get taxed at all. Their corporate company taxes have been cut and, and, and so on. Now, the next result of that is 300 billion pounds every year, which used to come to us in wages and services, and now goes to that tiny uh, sliver of uh, the population at the top of the uh, tree. So when they say we can't afford to restore council services, you can't afford a 50% uh, increase in pensions and benefits, or 15 pounds uh, 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 an hour, or restoring the libraries, the youth centres, the community centres, the NHS to what it used to be uh, uh, like. Give me uh, well, restoring social care into public ownership of councils so they can be properly paid, properly trained, 
And our elderly people properly looked after. When they say we can't afford to do that, we say we're not a poor country. We're a very rich country. Just the wrong people have got the money. The wrong people have got the money. So that's why I'm standing. <laughs> because we need to change society so that the wealth which is produced by working people is owned and controlled by them. But you don't just get it by the petition online. You don't just get it by wishing for it. You have to build for it. And when we come to the bigger battles, the people who've got that money, the billionaires, and the politicians who work for them, the millionaires, who tell the rest of us, we're greedy by the way, <laughs> they're not going to give it up like that. We have to build a mass party that's rooted in the organisations and the communities of the working class that can change this country for the better. Because the establishment parties have got an overlapping agenda that protects the system, and the system rewards them with high wages, MPs making 2,000, or the rest of it higher up the, uh, the tree to keep them uh, loyal. Now, they will debate how working people should pay these price rises. We're going to get a debate into this debate and say, why yeah. should working people be paying these prices? Yeah. So, the last bit, working people in uh, uh, Didon, possibly more than anywhere else uh, in the country, already feel that nobody speaks to them, all politicians are the same, once they get down to London, they forget about the people who send them down there, they're only in it for themselves, uh, and because of that, barely half the people in Erdington vote for anybody at a general election. You may not know this, but there are 650 constituencies in Britain that send MPs. This constituency is eighth from the bottom of the people who vote in the election. Now that's not us blaming people, they can't see anybody from any established party that's going to make any difference to their lives. So yes, we want to shake up a few Tories in this uh, uh, election and uh, put their record as a Tory government in front of them and say, why are you voting for Boris Johnson to continue in office? And yes, we want to shake up a few Labour voters our way in this election and say, why are you going to elect somebody who's currently on 41,000 who thinks that home care workers on 15 or 16,000 are overpaid, who wants a job on 82,000 pounds, what difference is she going to make? <laughs> but more importantly than that, we want to say to the 47% of people in Huntington who don't vote for anybody in a general election, we've got a, a little bit of a chance in this election to make a bit of history, but only if you get involved. And not just on March the 3rd. We've got seven wards in this uh, constituency elect. 10 uh, councils. Let's see if we can't put a few socialists on the council from this constituency in May and wider in Birmingham uh, it, it itself. But we do say particularly to those who were inspired by Jeremy Corbyn for the radical change he could make to the Labour Party, they're totally dismayed by Labour, and again Chris is right, 150,000 people have left the Labour Party in the last uh, 22 uh, months because of the uh, we, we do say to those uh, people, don't drop out, Get involved in a serious fight for a socialist uh, alternative. The people of Erdington lend us your vote uh, uh, on, on March uh, the 3rd. Uh, join us uh, and get involved if you can. Join us and get involved in the long term uh, if you can. Um, the only promise we make is we won't let you down. Thanks for listening.